Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. 2024 begins with two major wars being fought in Ukraine and the Middle East. So, what happens next? Probably a full-scale mobilization after the election. So Russia will try to close the Ukrainian chapter on its own terms. We have a serious problem on our hands if the Israeli government does not change their approach. But there are many other events and places that could impact our defence and security over the next 12 months. A lot of turmoil, worsening civil conflict in large parts of Africa. We should certainly be watching a number of confrontations between the Chinese Coast Guard and Philippine vessels. Mike and I are joined by a team of eminent experts for some crystal ball gazing, trying to see through the mists and give our best assessments of what lies ahead. And some of the people in charge of our defence will tell us definitively what they'll be doing in the next year. We've got a really important bit of work to do to ensure that we increase numbers coming into the army. And we're going to be busy continuing our support to Ukraine. Zitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Mike, it's that time where we ask you to do the impossible and predict the future. What does 2024 hold in store? Well, nothing terribly good at the moment. It's a continuation of things which have been sliding towards more disorder. And, you know, when you think of it in historical terms, there was a, you know, there was a big, as they say these days, an inflection point economically in 2008 with the economic crisis and that began to have real political consequences by about 2013 2014 that set off a series of trends which have started to have their inflection point in 2021 22 23 and i think that's the period we're now living through where the structure of international politics is changing quite quickly. You know, they say it's like bankruptcy. You know, how do, how, do, how do you go bankrupt? You go bankrupt in two ways. First, gradually, then suddenly. Mm. And we've been going gradually towards, not necessarily bankruptcy, but a big structural change. And now we're starting to go suddenly towards a big structural change. And I think that's where we are. And so 2024 will be quite a scary year in the ways that you've just indicated from those clips and a few more things besides. Well, with the help of some of the experts who've guided us through 2023, we'll take a tour of the world and get their insights about what lies ahead. But let's start with what the next 12 months hold for Britain's armed forces. And for this, rather than just going to expert observers, we've got the thoughts of some of the people doing the work. I'm General Sir Patrick Sanders, Chief of the General Staff. The biggest and the most important challenge we face is sustaining the Ukrainians in the fight in their war with Russia and making sure that our commitment keeps them in the fight, allows them to secure and regain the territory that they've lost in Ukraine and show Putin and his regime that our endurance will outlast theirs, our commitment to Ukraine's security is undiminished and constant. My name's Major Andy Tang. I am the officer commanding of the handling and processing facility on Operation Interflex. For the last six months, I've worked on Interflex uh, delivering black bag kit items to Ukrainian soldiers. And since the operation started in June of last year, we've processed over 32,000 Ukrainians. For next year, uh, we hope to continue the great work that we've done to date, supporting our colleagues in their victory in Ukraine. I guess the second biggest challenge will be playing our part in trying to bring peace to the Middle East and ensure that the awful suffering that is happening on both sides in Gaza is resolved. And then institutionally, um, we've got a really important bit of work to do to ensure that we increase numbers coming into the army. You know, we are recruiting, we're recruiting well, but I need new lifeblood coming into the army from all parts of the UK and all of the communities. And then keeping the pace of our modernization going. It's an incredibly exciting journey. We've got over 200 armored vehicles coming in to the British Army every year for the next five years. It's the most profound transformation of the British Army in my lifetime, but it will take all of our efforts to keep it going. I'm Admiral Sir Ben Key. I'm the first Sea Lord and professional head of the Royal Navy. I'm optimistic for 2024. There will be a huge range of challenges that we will need to confront and deal with, but I am confident that the men and women of the service, that the Royal Marines and sailors, our civil servants and our industrial partners and contractors who support us will rise to each and every challenge. Whether it's at home here around the United Kingdom, in the waters that are under the NATO banner, or further afield to our friends and allies as far 
far away as in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Hello, my name is Captain Richard Paul Hewitt. I'm the captain of HMS Prince of Wales and in 2024 I'll be focused on generating HMS Prince of Wales to take over the role as the very high readiness strike carrier for the Royal Navy in preparation for her deployment in 2025. I am Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Knighton and I'm Chief of the Air Staff. Looking forward to 2024, I really don't know what the world is going to present to us. We know in 2023 that it's unstable and getting more dangerous. We in the Air Force need to be ready to fly and fight and be ready to do whatever the country needs of us. I've been very optimistic about the future, about the quality of our people, about the quality of our equipment, but I've also been a realist and realistic about some of the challenges we face in terms of our workforce, our infrastructure and making sure that people have the training that they need. But ultimately I'm confident with the quality of the people we have in the Royal Air Force, that history of solving problems, that we will be able to address all of the challenges we face. It's going to require hard work from me and the leadership team, but we'll be doing that tirelessly over the next year. Golly, Mike, uh, there's a lot in there, and that's just a snapshot from a few people, but it all seems to be dominated by conflicts that we're not directly party to. Yeah, and uh, and we think that we've got a role to play in all of those things. In Patrick Sanders was very interesting. The first thing he said is that we must keep Ukraine in the fight, not help mm. Ukraine to win because they're not going to win next year. We know that now that this is going to be a long war, and the main problem is keep them in the fight. Interesting that he used that phrase, very resonant of Second World War thinking, not, not keep them in the war, keep them in the fight. And everyone there thinks they're going to be busy, and that's absolutely right. I mean, Patrick Saunders is absolutely right. The army is going to be really busy transforming. The Navy, as Ben Key said, is going to be busy operating. And Dick Knighton for the Air Force said, we're going to be busy doing whatever. <laughs> and that's, that's a typical Air Force way. They don't really know what they're going to do. We should do whatever. You know, you He's honest, us, we'll, though. Actually, we'll do it. We'll do it as best we can. We'll do whatever as best we can. I mean, you, you, you really got three you know, services talking their language there. Mm. And, and, you know, one of the problems that comes through that is that because, it, it, you know, our numbers are low, our numbers of platforms are low, our numbers of personnel are low, and there is there are morale issues that you know, the mm. chiefs wouldn't tr try to deny that. And we ask so much more of them. And one example, of which I think we've mentioned before on the program, HMS Duncan, which has been in the Adriatic on a long NATO tour, it's been, it's been at sea for nine months and the crew aren't going to get home for Christmas. Their tour has been extended to go to the Eastern Mediterranean because of the Gaza War. So they're going to have to do maybe 12 months um, over the Christmas period. And that, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they'll do their job and they'll do it well. But the idea that we're constantly asking our service personnel to go above and beyond all the time because they're stretched. Now, you can, you can only do that for so many years before people start leaving early. And that's one of the problems that the, the chiefs know that they've got. So it's all very encouraging that we've got forces which are so willing and so agile in this way but ultimately you can't run at the edge of what you can do for too long. Okay so let, let's look at what might happen around the world and then a little later we can make more sense of what it means for British forces. So Ukraine 2024 will mark the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Uh, you said um, next year won't mean victory for Ukraine. Where do you think this war will be in 12 months time? I think it'll be in a situation where everybody's talking about the next offensive. The Ukrainians might have been able, if we've supported them properly during the year, to start an offensive maybe um, late summer in the autumn. That, even that might be a bit optimistic because they'll be still building up. The Russians will still be pushing, but the Russians can't launch a strategic offensive, you know, something like the invasion itself in February 22, until the spring of 2025 at the earliest. You look at what they're bringing in, the, the numbers they're going to mobilize, once the Russian elections are out of the way in March, the speed with which they're creating a war economy, the delivery of, of systems that we can estimate, they won't be in a position to actually push significantly more stuff into Ukraine until the winter of next year, which means a spring 2025 offensive. So I think what we'll be talking about is relatively marginal differences and a few surprises, and maybe some surprises around Crimea that will favor Ukraine. That's what I would sort of expect. But I think this time next year, we'll all be talking about the more decisive offensives which are going to start in 2025 and which may then determine how this phase of this long generational war will resolve itself for the next five years or so. Well, let's take a moment to look beyond Ukraine itself to Russia and the rest of Europe. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Marina Myron. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the War Studies Department at King's College London. It will be very interesting to see how Russia will handle the war in Ukraine, specifically because of the presidential elections in March. We believe that Putin might be leading Russia again, which is good news and bad news at the same time, because at least with Putin, we know more or less what to expect. Um, What is expected is uh, probably a a full-scale mobilization after the election, so Russia will try to close the Ukrainian chapter on its own terms. The war in Ukraine has certainly already affected Europe. As far as the tensions in the Balkans are concerned, I think that we will not see any serious conflict such as in in Ukraine. However, I predict instability in terms of small skirmishes and tensions growing. However, I don't think that anything significant will be happening in the Balkans, at least for 2024. Also because I don't think Russia has the capability of um, diverting its attention to other conflicts right now. Many have predicted that um, Russia might indeed attack Moldova. However, I do not think that Russia will try to get to Moldova because it is um, too close to NATO's borders. And I don't think that Russia at this stage can afford an escalation. We have to remember, again, as far as Moldova is concerned, as far as the Baltic states are concerned, Russia doesn't want an all-out war with NATO because Russia understands that it doesn't have the military capability, especially in light of the war in Ukraine, to face NATO on NATO's terms. Therefore, I think what we will be seeing are more sub-threshold operations, um, that is, operations that wouldn't necessarily trigger a military response. Mike, Marina seems relatively confident there won't be contagion to the rest of Europe in 2024, despite some of the rhetoric coming out of Moscow. What do you think? Yeah, I I think she's essentially right because the Russians can't um, mobilize enough forces to actually, you know, launch any sort of attack, say, on Moldova, and they're not close enough anyway. But what I mean, she was hinting there, what I think will be happening is is Russian attempts to destabilize in a few areas. So there's the Transnistrian Republic in Moldova, and if they can agitate the Transnistrian Republic, and that's not very difficult, they can destabilize Moldova. They can encourage Serbia to destabilize Bosnia in the way that doesn't take a lot of effort at the moment and it's almost happening. They can also encourage the Russian minorities in Estonia and Latvia, there isn't one in Lithuania but Estonia and Latvia, significant Russian minorities, they can encourage them to be more difficult with their own governments and create a sense that Russians are suffering you know, elsewhere in Europe. So I think we'll see attempts at destabilization and I'm sure we will see a great deal of attempted interference in Western elections, and there are quite a few of them in Western Europe and in Britain and in the United mm-hmm. States and in other countries around the world. And I think we'll see Russian involvement in a lot of elections or attempted involvement. So it'll be a year of, of as Marina says, sub-threshold activity, which will be quite difficult for us to pin down. Yeah, we'll, we'll address some of that, including the elections a little later on. Um, but what does it all mean for the UK's deployment to NATO's eastern flank? Will they stay the same or could they be bigger in 2024, do you think? I think they'll be bigger if we can. If we've got the capacity, I think that we'll try to push more forces into the areas where we can make a difference. And we have, you know, we have through the Joint Expeditionary Force, the JEF, we have a really good core there of northern countries. So the Scandinavian countries, Britain, uh, Denmark, Netherlands, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, 10 countries, all of whom take a pretty similar view of the Russian threat. All have got common interests, common interests in in the North Atlantic. And it's very much in Britain's interest for the JEF to become a more potent force within NATO. I mean, no way undermining NATO. It's all part of NATO but it can be a core of more ready forces in an area of Europe that does feel the pressure of Russia's incipient aggression, if you see what I mean. Um, and so while Southern Europe is more easily easily subject to the blandishments of Russian propaganda, Northern Europe, they don't take Russian propaganda remotely seriously, but they do feel that they're much closer to Russia and that they've got sea lanes to protect and air routes to protect and so on. Mm. Well, we'll have more to say on Ukraine in a while, but before that, we need to turn our attention to the Middle East. 
I am Ben Hodges, uh, U.S. Army Lieutenant General, retired, former commander of U.S. Army Europe. I think there's three um, aspects of this uh, war, Hamas on Israel war, that will affect 2024. First of all, I think the Hamas attack on Israel did in one day what Putin could not do in two years, and that's make the West forget about Ukraine. The Hamas attack on Israel has diverted attention, support, and resources away from Ukraine. That's going to continue into the into the coming year uh, unless we in the West are able to do something about it. Secondly, we have a serious problem on our hands if the Israeli government does not change their approach. Uh, the objective given to the Israeli Defense Force, destroy Hamas, is a worthy objective, but that's not a suitable strategic end state. There needs to be a political dimension to this, something that talks about Israel has to peacefully coexist with the Palestinians at the end of this. The third aspect of this is uh, the West has got to get organized and think about Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, uh, China, Iran in one strategic construct. Uh, so that we organize ourselves through our alliances, we build up our d uh, defense industrial capacity, and demonstrate the political will to address all of these issues. Uh, otherwise, I think none of them are going to go away. A lot of questions there and few if any answers. Are we still going to be talking about this as an ongoing war in 12 months' time? Probably not as an ongoing war, but almost certainly as an ongoing problem, because the um, Middle East may be, uh, you know, reforming itself as a result of this war. I mean, the fighting in Gaza will have stopped then, at least in in the terms that we're seeing it now. But the issue is is so irreconcilable at the moment. I mean, I've I've been hearing from governments in the Gulf, Arab governments in the Gulf, particularly if you think about you know the Saudis and the Qataris and the United Arab Emirates, and they say we will not, we will absolutely not allow Israel to destroy Gaza on the assumption that we, the rich Arabs, will then build it up again. And they say if you want to begin, even begin talks about the future of the Palestinians in Gaza, then we'll only countenance coming to those talks if we're talking about the Palestinians in general, all of the Palestinians. And that means that you, Israel, have got to rethink the way your state handles the Palestinians, who are, after all, 20% of your current citizens, and with the occupied territories, they're 40% of the people that you're responsible for. And that irreconcilable problem, on, on the other side, is that Israel says, we, we are not going to live next to the Palestinians anymore. Well, you're going to have to. And so that issue will go round in circles for the rest of the year, and Gaza will not be rebuilt unless or until Israel is prepared to talk about becoming a different Israel. And mm -hmm. at the moment, you know, as we finish 2023, Israel isn't even, be, isn't even at first base in talking about that because they say we've got to win the war. Now, they will win the war in some respects. They'll, they, they, at least they'll declare victory and leave. And then we're back to this conundrum that we can only move on if Israel is prepared to deal with the Palestinian issue again in total and the Israelis have said, well, after the Hamas attack, how can we possibly go for a two-state solution? How can we live side by side with these people? Because they'll do it again. And that's where we'll be next year, I think. And up to this point, it's been largely contained to Israel and Hamas. But as we go into 2024, does that look sustainable? I hope it is. The big issue is, is what happens in southern Lebanon, and that's controlled by Iran. The Hezbollah are in southern Lebanon. Basically, they do what Tehran tells them. And at the moment, Tehran is saying to them, we are, we're pretty sure, keep it low, keep it down. We're not going to turn off the tap completely, but we certainly don't want to provoke an outright war with Israel at the moment because they'd also be provoking reaction from the United States. But as we go through the year, um, the Houthis in Yemen, who are a, a, a right nuisance at the moment in that they're holding the Red Sea at, at risk, that's a separate problem in a way it's linked to it of course but it's actually that can be dealt with as a separate issue and it'll be irritating and difficult and it will cause disruptions to world trade but the key um, regional issue is what happens in Lebanon and the way the Iranians as it were order their proxies to behave and I don't think they've got the Iranians that don't have full control over the Houthis and so they can't quite stop the Houthis you know taking pot shots and everything that goes past but I think that there's a reasonable hope that a wider regional crisis will not necessarily break out next year, but I think we'll hover on the edge of one for several months. 
Well, let's get one more thought. And this is looking at the possibility that there is some kind of tentative peace deal in the Israel Hamas war. I'm General Sir Richard Browns. I'm a former commander of Joint Forces Command and now I'm co chairman of Universal Defence and Security Solutions. If, and it's a huge if, it came to an agreement that there had to be a third force, external peace support in Gaza to separate the Israeli Defence Forces from. Uh, from the Palestinians and, and the remnants of, of Hamas, then there are very few places you can go than to Europe for that quality of effort. And if you come to Europe, you'll come to the UK. What do you think of that idea, Mike? Uh, it's quite alarming. I mean, he's absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, I've been toying with the idea, well, you think about, well, Turkish troops, maybe troops from the Gulf states, Muslim troops, um, which would be sensible, Egyptian troops as a possibility, but none of those countries are keen to do it. And Richard is is not wrong when he said, you know, you want troops with high expertise. And, you know, the Israeli army are showing now, the IDF, is that they're very well trained, but they're not well trained enough to do what they're trying to do now. You know, they've made so many slip ups, I mean, real dis- dis- disastrous slip ups in recent uh, weeks and days that you realize that even this very professional well-trained army is not good enough to do what mm. needs to be done in Gaza and so yeah you come to the United Kingdom I the, the idea of a, a of a for a UK force doing this is to, to me unrealistic because if you yeah. look at the um, you look at the numbers you're looking for a force about a hundred thousand troops for a two million population on the standard basis of how many how many peacekeepers you need in so many in a population this size or that side two million Million gives you a number of about 100,000 to keep order. Well, you know, that, that's big yeah. the whole British Army. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you could, you could imagine some sort of multinational force in which a British battle group could maybe take the lead and provide the core element. That would be the framework nation. That's possible. But I, I shudder to think how mm. that would be received. And I think there would be zero political support for it in the country in Britain. And of course, you know, Richard you know, knows that full well. Um, so we're talking pretty hypothetically here. But if you could yeah. put together a, a basic, a multinational force with Muslim soldiers that could be somehow supported a bit remotely by European, NATO and British forces, then you might begin to get towards first base. But that's a long, long way away. So uh, the two big wars of 2023 are likely to dominate again in 2024. But what else should we be watching out for? I'm Shashank Joshi, defence editor at The Economist magazine in London, where I cover everything to do with the military, intelligence and national security. And before that, I was a senior fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London. 2024 is perhaps going to be marked most profoundly by a series of important elections around the world. I think the two most important of these are the Taiwanese election and the election in the United States later in the year. But I could also point to uh, elections in Russia, uh, which will be very important for the standing of Vladimir Putin and some others in Europe as well. But that election in Taiwan has the potential to be perhaps the most destabilizing, because if it is won by candidates who favor a more independent Taiwan, uh, more distance from Beijing, that could prompt a more aggressive saber rattling policy from China in ways that could, I think, cause a lot of problems for the United States and its partners in Asia. We shouldn't forget the geopolitical rivalries playing out in Africa. I think it's fascinating that over the last year we have seen France, the former colonial power in large parts of Africa, effectively withdraw from the region, forced out by regimes like those in Mali, who have in turn moved closer to Russia. And they have invited in mercenary organizations like the Wagner Group. So Western influence, particularly in West Africa and North Africa, is being displaced by Russia. And I think that that could result in a lot of turmoil, worsening civil conflict in large parts of Africa and some very difficult questions for the US and particularly for Europe and and in particular for France that will have to decide how much they cede this region to Russia and how much they choose to contest it despite all their other demands. 
apart from geography, we've got to keep an eye on the new domains of space and cyber. And in the cyber realm, it's been interesting to see how ransomware attacks, these have been getting worse and worse and worse. And I think there's little to expect this to improve next year. Um, we will see more organizations suffer major ransomware attacks. And Western cyber agencies, intelligence agencies will have to go after these criminal organizations, many of them based in the former Soviet Union or in Russia itself, with renewed vigor, perhaps attacking their servers, attacking their personnel using cyber means. And I think that cyber contest will become much more aggressive and contested. Mike, you talked on the SITREP crystal ball last year about spring-loaded traps waiting to snap if disturbed. And you mentioned Israel and the Palestinian territories. That certainly snapped this year. Sudan was another trap that snapped. Uh, Shashank points there to significant instability in Africa. Where do you think the traps are for 2024? Yeah, there are a lot of the Eastern Mediterranean in general is a spring loaded trap. I think I mentioned that last year as well. The other spring loaded trap, of course, is around Taiwan and the South China Sea. Um, you never quite know how it's going to play out, but you won't be surprised if it does. We look at um, Guyana, Venezuela mm. and Guyana. Are the Venezuelans going to, be, going to invade Guyana to grab two thirds of the territory because there is now, since, only since 2015, massive oil reserves off the coast? In general, the view is that it's, it's all a bluff. Maduro is just bluffing at the moment because he wants to create an issue out of this because he's got elections coming up as well. And that's entirely plausible. But one of the things that Shashank was talking about there, which I think is really important, that Africa is descending into you know the, the trend of the world in general, which is dictatorship and gangsterism. And across the whole of the Sahel, you've got these you know, miserable military dictatorships who are no, no more than gangsters in uniform. And that goes back to Venezuela, Guyana. Maduro wouldn't, wouldn't be, have begun to even think in these terms five or eight years ago. But now in the 2020s, the mid 2020s, he thinks he might have a chance of getting away with this. Why don't, why don't you grab two thirds of Guyana's territory and grab all the oil? There'll be nothing to stop you. You know, the Western world will not be able to prevent it happening because that's one, one of these tipping points that we're at. The growth of gangsterism and autocracy, dictatorship in so many parts of the world is very disturbing. And when I look for these spring loaded traps, I now see them in lots of other places connected to the, the decline of governance and the rise of autocrats and gangsters. And they're fed by Russia, who, get, who gains from this, China, who takes a fairly benign view of gangsters, as long as they behave themselves from Beijing's point of view, and some of the other disruptive actors like Iran and North Korea, who themselves you know, lead a sort of gangsterist movement um, across many parts of the world. Well, they say war is politics by other means. And as Shashank Joshi mentioned, we cannot ignore the big political decisions that will be taken next year and their possible impact on our defence and security. Let's start with the first of those important elections and the impact it could have in Asia. My name is Nicholas May and I'm the Asia correspondent for The Telegraph. And I'm currently based in Seoul, South Korea. Previously, I was based in Taipei in Taiwan. I I think if 2022 and 2023 are anything to go by, then we can expect the unexpected. But if we start, first of all, from what we have seen towards the end of 2023, we saw President Xi Jinping uh, meet President Joe Biden. And so there was something of a reset between China and the US towards the end of 2023. But 2024 will really test whether uh, relations can remain steady and constructive between China and the United States. And one of the first big tests of that relationship is going to be the Taiwanese elections on January 13th. Now we're facing new, a new president, uh, untested president. We don't know who that's going to be. If the current ruling DPP, Democratic People's Party, if they win, then China will be unhappy and we could see an uptick of military exercises around Taiwan. 
Taiwan. We could also see some form of economic coercion against Taiwan. North Korea, I think we can expect more uh, ballistic missile tests, but I think we will also see a continuation of closer ties with Russia. So that was one of the big developments over 2023. The US and South Korea believe that there, there has been a weapons deal between Russia and North Korea. So I think we'll see more developments on that front in 2024 that may confirm those allegations. We should certainly be watching tensions over the South China Sea. We've seen an escalation between uh, the Philippines and China over disputed territory. Uh, We've seen a number of confrontations between the Chinese Coast Guard and Philippine vessels who have been trying to resupply troops who are based on a World War II era ship that has been was deliberately grounded on an underground reef there. It's becoming more and more tense. And you do have the United States has re- said repeatedly that if China attacks the Philippines in any way, that it will come to the Philippines defense. So that is one flashpoint that we definitely need to watch because it remains unresolved. So, Micah, much in the way of political tensions in the region, backed up by a lot of very demonstrative military posturing, will it stay confined to posturing in 2024? Not necessarily, because I think a lot of this posturing is the beginning of a a military campaign. So it's not all posturing. I mean, the the Chinese really are pushing in the South China Sea. I mean, in 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 a sort of fit of strategic foolishness, Xi Jinping has alienated every one of the states around China exactly at a time when he wants to put pressure on Taiwan. And so, you know, making China so unpopular with all its neighbours is not strategically sensible, but the Chinese seem to be determined to to push on that front. And is in relation to Taiwan, you know, this is the this is the beginnings in a way of the, of the of the whole campaign. Nobody really believes that for the next 10 years or so, China would ever try to invade Taiwan. But what it is trying to do, and it is, I think, already starting, is the blockade strategy, like the boa constrictor strategy, to actually create a sort of a barrier around Taiwan, always in fairly minor ways, relatively trivial ways, and then keep building it up and building it up. So it's the boa constrictor idea, and it challenges the West to find a a relatively small issue to threaten to go to war over, to stop Mm. it. And that's what I think we're, we're seeing now. What the Chinese want in Taiwan is what the Americans say they will not permit And at some point, as the boa constrictor strategy tightens, the Americans are going to have to make a choice. Yeah. And what would that choice be? I mean, what if what if Beijing did do something like that and effectively blockaded Taiwan around the time of the Taiwanese uh, Taiwanese elections? What substantially can the West do? The Americans then would, would put a big naval presence there and they would, there would be a standoff between Chinese naval power, air and ships, and American naval power. And at some point, they, they might you know, calm down again and they all go away and then they come back in two years' time and do it again. But the more they do it, the more likely it is that that, that then at some point becomes a militarized crisis. You know, it's not inevitable by any means. Nothing's inevitable. But we're on the road that leads in that direction. And it, you know, the first example of it might might come around the Taiwanese elections or the results of the elections if they go in the way that Beijing finds unacceptable. Right. Um, Seeing as we're doing politics and elections, uh, let's return to retired US Lieutenant General Ben Hodges for his thoughts on the big one. Yeah, I assume you're not talking about the Super Bowl. The uh, presidential election is overshadowing everything. And of course, the uh, Republican likely nominee, Donald Trump, former president, a lot of things can happen in a year. The actual election itself is 11 months away. Uh, former President Trump has numerous uh, judicial hurdles he's got to get over. And I think that it's going to be a close election, uh, but he should be defeated. Uh, it will be a catastrophe, I think, for American democracy if he is reelected. It will undermine confidence that our European friends and allies having us. And of course, he talks all the time about pulling out of NATO or uh, turning his back on Europe. So this is a concern. And it's interesting that Republicans and the Congress openly 
support uh, stopping aid to Ukraine. Uh, I never in my life would have thought that Republicans would be using Kremlin talking points. The party of Reagan would turn their back on, on Ukraine in favor of, of Russia. This is a dream come true for the Kremlin, for the U.S. to, uh, under Donald Trump, to either pull out of NATO or, or continue to question American commitment to defense and security of Europe. That sort of Friction also would be a gift to China. Now, of course, the current administration, President Biden, has to run for president also. And uh, and he's got to reach people. He's got to get um, motivate people to turn out and vote. I think at the end of the day, uh, he will. Uh, but it'll be a very close election. General Ben doesn't mince his words there. A catastrophe if Donald Trump returns to the White House. Yes, there's a lot at stake, but we we saw when he was president, his actions don't always live up to his political rhetoric. No, and I mean, no president's actions ever do compared to what they say as a candidate. They say whatever they need to say as a candidate to get elected. And then when you're in the in the job, you're constrained in different ways. But there are two big elements here, which is what really worries people. One is that after his first four years in power, he's learned the system. And so he knows now what he calls the deep state, which is what you and I would just call government. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, he knows how to play it. And secondly, the general view is he'd be vengeful. And he would take his revenge on lots of organizations and interests, foreign and domestic, that he wanted to. Because in a way, after all the controversy, after all the viciousness of his period in power and his period in opposition, he would have to make it count by showing that he was prepared to throw over the old order. I mean, yeah, we talk about President Putin and Xi Jinping are explicit revisionists. They want to change the rules of world politics. Well, if Trump were elected, he's revisionist as well. So So Russia, China and the United States, as long as he's in charge, will be revisionist. And the expectations, one of the reasons why I think Ben talks about that being a catastrophe is that I think if Trump were elected, everyone assumes that he would be bad for NATO because he'd threaten to maybe even pull America out of NATO, regardless of what Congress said. I think NATO would start to self-destruct. And that's the problem, that I think that in anticipation of a Trump presidency, if he were elected, I think the southern elements of NATO, southern countries of NATO, would start to lean and do deals separately with a smooth-talking Putin. And NATO would start to self-destruct under his shadow, under Trump's shadow, regardless of what he did or didn't do. And on the funding for Ukraine, what happens if it does dry up or or get cut significantly? Is it game over for Ukraine? Is there a real realistic prospect of Europe filling the gap? There is a prospect of Europe doing that. I mean, the the funding for Ukraine is held up at the moment. The American funding is $61 billion. And the European funding, which is being held up by Viktor Orban in Hungary, is 50 billion euros, which is roughly equivalent to $50 billion. So the Europeans can replace American, immediate American funding in the immediate sense. But of course, Ukraine needs both amounts. They need $60 billion and 50 billion euros in order to keep going next year. Does that mean, I mean, if, if all else fails and the Ukrainians are just left by the West, as it were, with without the sort of aid they need or with only small amounts of it. Does that mean they lose the war? No. It means that they lose their war of liberation, which is what they've been trying to pursue. They will carry on with their guerrilla war of survival. They're not going to lose that because 44 million of them are determined that they will not live under Russian control and they hate the Russians. Believe me how much they hate the Russians after the last two years. The war won't end, it'll just change its nature. Right, there is one more election we should consider that is on the horizon, almost certainly in 2024. There's going to be an election by January 2025 and whoever wins the election is likely to have a defence review, as it happens, the Labour Party have said that they'll start it the day they take office. And this review and all reviews are important and we should remember every single review in my lifetime has failed to balance ambition and resources, but we should always try uh, and, and do better. And so the review that's coming is going to have to unlock the terrible conditions that apply right now to the armed forces where there is so little cash for training and travel and infrastructure and also major pressures in the in the equipment program so one way or another a defense review has got to settle the ambition and square it with resources and in there are really profound questions for restoring the army which as a matter of policy is is not being recapitalized for a couple of years and balancing that with the very important work in AUKUS and and the investment in in the GCAP program. 
The thoughts there of General Sir Richard Barons once again. Micah, given the financial, political and international situations, how much is actually at stake in a post-election defence review? Because some might argue whoever wins the result for defence could be largely the same. Yeah, I think that's essentially true. I mean, John Healy, who's the um, opposition's Labour Party spokesman for defence, he, if Labour win the election, will certainly become the defence secretary. And I'm very impressed by him. I think he's very good. He under- he's been doing the job for a while. He's a, he's a steady, careful thinker. Um, he's a very effective operator and he's not he doesn't grandstand at all a lot of people don't know that much about him and he has some very good ideas about how to move the the current agenda forward and create better genuine efficiencies and do things differently his problem and he's very aware of this there is simply no cash uh, yeah. above and beyond what's already there for defence. And so he'll be working, not not with, with the cupboard is bare, but the cupboard's not going to get any bigger for the first two or three years until, or unless, the country achieves some economic growth under new management. Well, just say the Conservatives win, Mike. Do you think Grant Shapps would stay Defence Secretary? I doubt it. I mean, not because he's not he's pretty good at what he does. Um, and people say he's actually good at defence because he spent years defending the indefensible during the <laughs> Boris Johnson years. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, he's he's somebody who um, the Conservative Party values as a fixer. He's a, he's a good political operator. He's good. He presents himself well to the public. And I think they'd use him somewhere else. And I, I don't I mean, I think Labour will win the election in my own view. But you can't rule out the idea. Of course, Conservatives <laughs> might have a good year. Rishi Sunak might be able to create this sense that he does represent a new strand of conservatism and that there may be a you know a new revitalized conservative government but there has to be a really new front bench if there's going to be that and i think grand shops would be used somewhere else if that were the case okay time now for some final thoughts i'm admiral sir tony radikin the uk chief of defense when i look into 2024 there are three big things that stand out it's going to continue to be a busy year And we're going to be busy continuing our support to Ukraine and and helping them to get their country back and to recover their territory. We've also got an enormous responsibility in the Middle East. How do we help to avoid that crisis in the Middle East escalating? Because that will impact on all of us. We're heavily involved and we might have to do more. And then the third thing is how do we modernize our armed forces and the whole of defense? We spend a lot of money on behalf of the nation. We've got some opportunities for some amazing new kits, but we also need to look at our systems, our structures, our processes, and be a better and even better organization that looks after our people in an even better way and also delivers even more for our brilliant nation. Mike, hearing that from the Chief of Defence Staff and everything we've talked about, what kind of year do you think 2024 will be for the men and women of Britain's armed forces? I think it'll be a year that's been characterised all through this programme by a single word, busy. They mm. will be busy. And and I think Tony Radikin is absolutely right there. That One of the things that we've got to do next year for the armed forces is reconnect them a bit more directly than we have recently to the nation and to the nation's interests. You know, politicians always sort of assume that defence, you know, there are no votes in defence. That's what politicians always say. Mm. I'm not sure about that. Faced with the world we are now faced with, and it's in our newspapers and on our news channels every day, faced with what we're faced with, I'm not sure that the public don't think we ought to be spending more on defence, even at the cost of domestic programmes. And I think the public have a, have a bigger sense of the importance of defence than our politicians think they have. And I guess we might see a bit of that during the election campaign next year. Mike, thank you so much and thank you to all of our guests. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back for the first sit rep of 2024 on the 11th of January. Who knows what will have already happened by then, but we will be here to explain. And now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 